Hey lovelies, this is Cookie, and you're listening to Cookie Jar Unleashed, a podcast that'll bring you author spotlights, news on the latest book releases, and so much more. Buckle up and enjoy the ride. Hey lovelies, this is Cookie. Thank you so much for tuning in to Cookie Jar Unleashed podcast. I am super excited for today's episode. However, before we get started, I do want to say thank you for such a warm welcome into the podcast world. Episode 1 was such a huge success. I cannot say thank you enough to all of you who tuned in, who commented on my social media pages, or text me. I mean, just thank you so much. I'm not going to beat a dead horse, because that is not why you're here. You're here to hear about books. So, let's get on with the show. All right, we have A Delicate Proposition by Lane Daniels that released on May 23rd. That is a serial killer anti-heroin romance. Also released on May 23rd was Sold to the Pirate by Fern Fraser. It is an insta-love, possessive man, steamy short read. Defending My Heart by Barbara Campbell is a steamy contemporary romance that released May 24th. And releasing today, we have Rescue Me by Mia Brody, an insta-love short read. So congratulations and happy release day, Mia. Super exciting. Earlier in the month, we had Forbidden Muse by Alana Winters, a rock star mafia that released. We also had Easy Surrender by Nicole Rose, a military romance. Those both released earlier in the month. Let's see, we have June, like June's tomorrow, you guys, like that's hard to believe. Let's get to the June releases. We have Break Even by Hope Malone. Opposites attract curvy girl short romance. Also, June 10th, we have Razor's Edge by Andy Lynn, an MC romance. Then we have Sex, Lies, and Techie Guys by Barbara Campbell. That is a steamy contemporary menage romance that's releasing June 28th. Real quick, I want to throw out there, June 11th, I actually have a release coming out. Um, It's called A Hitman's Rose. That's under my pen name, S.E. Isaac. That releases June 11th. All right, July pre-orders that are on my radar. We have Vanilla Cupcakes and Twisted Rainbows by Jesse Bond. That is a romance that is releasing July 2nd. The Passion Fruit Files, Murder on Independence Day by C.K. Timber. That is a cozy mystery, clean paranormal romance fantasy that releases July 3rd. Cordial Cherry on Top by April Lynn Baker. That is an MC fairy tale retelling that releases July 20th. The Dark Tide by Maria Vermisiglau. Sorry, Maria, I always mess up your name. That is a young adult magical academy merman, and that releases July 26th. Also on the book radar, there is Aliens on Earth. That is a St. Jude's charity anthology and sci-fi romance. That is releasing May 9th, 2023. Pre-order is available now. Call Me Freak by J.A. Rolls. That is a dark stalker romance that releases March 27, 2023, and that is also up for pre-order. That is today's book list. However, that does not conclude today's episode. After this brief commercial, we'll be right back. Welcome back, lovelies. In the oven today, we have an amazing author. She's new to me. However, I'm so glad to have gotten to know her, and I know you guys are just going to adore her. So, without further ado, I give you our guest author. Hey everybody, I am author Justina Luther, and it looks like I am in the oven today. Is it hot in here? Well, I guess they haven't turned it on yet. (laughs) A big thank you to S.E. Isaac, aka Cookie, for having me into the cookie jar today. We are so glad to have you. Do you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? As I mentioned, I am Justina Luther. That is my one and only pen name. I write multiple genres all under that same name. So if you ever want to find my work, you can find it on Amazon under author Justina Luther. I am from the USA. It's pretty much what I always say when people ask me because I have lived in so many states. I don't really consider anyone um, to be where I'm from. My uh, lexicon, I can't think of another word for it, (laughs) is from pretty much all over the states. You'll hear me say y'all, you'll hear me say soda, you'll hear me say pop, you'll hear me say uh, pretty much dialogue from all 50 states. (laughs) I'm all over the place. Um, So yep, I'm just USA born and bred. (laughs) 
All right, I'm gonna turn up the heat on the oven. What made you become an author? I'm pretty sure that I was an author from coming out of the womb. I've always been uh, a storyteller uh, for the good and the bad as a child. Um, it wasn't until I learned to, to pick up a pencil that I learned that I can do those stories and put them down on paper and um, not get in trouble. <laughs> I, it, it was a fine line between uh, sharing a story that was bubbling in my imagination and flat out lying when I was little. Not something I'm proud of, but uh, just the truth. There were so many times that my mother would turn to me and I'd be telling this big, long story and she'd get this look on her face and she'd go, Justina, did this happen? At which point I would immediately just dissolve into giggles. Uh, so yes, I've been an, a storyteller my whole life, so becoming an author was just sort of a natural for me. And what genres do you find yourself dabbling in? Do you have a favorite genre that you write? I am multi-genre. I write sweet romance, young adult, new adult, fantasy, horror, suspense, thriller, and I'm working on a mystery right now. And I think, <laughs> I think that's everything for the moment. Um, my favorite is all of them. My imagination, as you may have noticed, goes all over the place, which is why I write so many genres. Um, pretty much whatever idea is really just firing off in my brain, that is going to be my favorite genre of the moment because that is where my head is. That is understandable, but is there like a least favorite genre that you like would much rather not write? My least favorite is always automatically the first time I step into a genre because there's this thing in the back of my brain that tells me, oh, you've never done this before. It's gonna be totally different. Where, you know, at their core, all stories, regardless of genre, have the same components. Yes, there, there are certain things that make them different, obviously, but uh, you know, if, if you know how to tell a good story, you know how to tell a good story. So there's a lot of overlap there. But yes, uh, the favorite, the least favorite is always um, whatever is newest for me because it's very intimidating until like my second or third time into the genre. <laughs> I'm a perfectionist. I think a lot of the listeners and also a lot of authors can relate to that as far as being a perfectionist. I imagine that would make things difficult. Is there anything else that would be difficult when it comes to trying to write? Anything in particular come to mind? The hardest part, again, varies from day to day. I am someone who I can either focus very, very well, or my brain is like a two-year-old who's been given Red Bull and uh, Pixie Sticks all over the place, very quickly, running like crazy. So if it's a Red Bull and Pixie Sticks day, um, writing. Writing can be the hardest part because I've, I've got a billion ideas. I know where I want them to go. Getting myself to actually sit down and get the words out can be very <laughs> tricky. Um, other days, marketing is the hardest part and any author will tell you um, that it, it's a little bit like standing in the middle of a crowd of a million people and you're all screaming, look at me. <laughs> so marketing, marketing is very difficult. And I think that's not just for authors. I think that's for anybody who's trying to sell, especially online. So that can be the hardest part. But then stuff like, you know, today with the podcast, this type of thing, I love to do. I love talking to people. I love um, letting readers get to know me and then uh, in other forms, getting to know them and things like that. So marketing can also be my favorite on some days, depending on what it is I'm doing. <clears throat> so yes, favorite and hardest parts uh, interchange with my mood. And how do I balance my personal life and writing? Over the last year, that has gotten, I'll say a lot trickier. Uh, May 2nd of last year, my father had, um, a medically induced brain bleed and so I have become one of his uh, full-time caretakers I split that duty with my mother so balancing between deadlines and uh, family life has become very interesting um, my dad lost the use of the right side of his body 
Um, he's slowly, he is slowly regaining it. Um, but within that, there's a lot of physical therapy, a lot of relearning, all those sorts of things that go into that, which requires effort each day. So there are some days where I don't write at all during the day. And if I have um, <clears throat> a deadline coming up at the end of the month, which I do, um, sometimes I'll be up until three or four in the morning at night writing and then up again in the morning to help with whatever. And <laughs> there have been times where my mom will turn and look at me and she'll just kind of see this zombie stare on my face. She goes, how many late nights have you been working? And I'm like, I'll just sort of mutter, ah, not that many. And she's like, okay, go upstairs, go work, get your stuff done today so you can sleep tonight. And then I, you know, I'll, I'll focus more on writing during the day on those days, <laughs> but it, it changes. But for me, the, um, the two priorities are number one, the heartbeats that I love, be it family, friends, or my pets. I'm, a to I'm an absolute am animal lover. But I also realized that I have a responsibility to my fans and to my publisher for the dates that I have promised to fulfill via contracts and things of that nature. Uh, I, I made the, I don't know if you call it brave or stupid at this point, choice of publishing um, 11 titles in one year span and I set up all of those dates before my father's uh, injury uh, and by the grace of God and the skin of my teeth I haven't missed one yet um, so yes there's it's it's difficult to balance but it, yeah you, you just you have to figure out what's important to you and then uh, sleep less <laughs> And by the way, I'm not um, not condoning, uh, not taking care of yourself and things of that nature. I know that I need to do better on that. I am so glad you mentioned self-care because yes, that is super important. So many of us neglect it, myself included. So again, like I said, I'm glad you mentioned that because yes, that is super important. All right, let's see here. What is your overall author dream or maybe like your author goal? My author dream is to be able to flat out make a decent living uh, with the books that I write and sell. I think, I think that pretty much goes for most authors, I would guess. But the goal for me is writing books that mean something to people. Now, whether that's um, it lets them escape from really, really difficult situations that they may be in, and give them their brains a few minutes break. I had an instance with my first series, um, my Step in the Darkness series, which is young adult, new adult uh, suspense thriller. I had a, a reader come up to me and uh, tell me that reading through that book had actually given them the courage to face some situations and some things that had happened in their past. And to me, that's that's what this is really all about. Yes, I want to entertain people, I want them to have fun, I want them to have escape, but if they can find something tangible, whatever that may mean for them between the pages, that to me is the goal of what I do. And that, that looks different for each person, so it's a little bit harder to put a fine point on, but my goal is for people to realize that I'm giving the best that I can for each book and for them to find something of note worthy in the pages. That is really awesome. And I'm pretty sure that's not the only reader who was able to take away something from your book and for your book to like truly help them get through hard times. So kudos to you, my friend, that is really amazing. And when you aren't helping people get through hard times with your words, where can we find you? Like what are your hobbies? What do you like to do? For me, you can find me, A, spending time with my family. Um, I love to read, I love to cook, I love to do all of those kinds of things. Anything creative, I love to do. Um, I love to sing when people aren't around. I'm trying to learn to play the piano. Uh, I love, like I said, cooking. I, my dad used to call me a mad scientist in the kitchen. Uh, because when I when I first started cooking, I would literally just go to the pantry, grab seven or eight things, and make something out of it. And that is something I still do. So I love cooking. I love 
making my friends laugh. I don't know if you can call that a hobby, but it's something I genuinely get a lot of enjoyment out of. That totally should be a hobby. If it's not, someone should make it one, I'm just saying. Um, so I heard you mention you like to read. So what do you like to read? Where do you like to read? Like, what's your favorite place to read? I do enjoy reading, especially when I've got a little more leisure time and I can really focus in on the story that I'm reading and I'm not super close to a deadline. Because when I'm super close to a deadline, I've constantly got the story that I'm working on playing through my head, which can make reading a little bit more difficult. But I, um, I love reading anywhere, but especially if it's raining, plop me down in front of a window with blinds open, with a chair that's super comfy that I can curl up in. That is my little slice of heaven right there. I love it. All right, so I have to be nosy. One, do you have a home library? And two, what is the last book you read? I do. Um, I have pretty much every book that has ever made a real impact on me from my childhood onward. So I've got, <laughs> I've got this big range of stuff from like Nancy Drew to Outlander to like everything <laughs> in between. And I still love reading all of them. Well, I'm actually reading a book right now uh, called Phantom by Susan Kay. Everybody always talks about, you know, read in your genre, read what's popular right now, or all that kind of stuff. And I, I agree with that from a technical standpoint. However, when I read, I don't necessarily want to think about marketing and work and all that kind of stuff, That makes, if that makes sense. So a lot of times what I do for my own reading enjoyment, I get books from either the used bookstore or the antique shop. So it's a lot of older titles but I love reading through those. And I especially love them when you find like notes from people who have read things previously, like in the margins and stuff. I am super weird. I won't draw or write in my own books. Like I just have this weird phobia almost of it, but I love finding books that other people have written. And I love to see their thoughts and their thought process as I'm reading through a book. Like I, there was a book that I was reading, I can't remember which one at the moment but there was some sort of comment like he did not just say that on one of the pages and i busted up laughing because i had literally had the same thought when i read that line so i was like yeah yeah i get it absolutely i don't know who wrote this but i get it <laughs> i am right there with you i cannot write in a book i had such a hard time in school when they wanted me to highlight in a book like your notes and stuff like i totally had a hard time with that so totally understand. Um, you mentioned how you saw someone else write something in a book. Well, I saw something online and it's always book boyfriends. So curious minds want to know, do you have a book boyfriend? Is there any author or reader who does not have a book boyfriend? Like fictional? Yeah, uh, yes. Do, it, are we supposed to only have one? If we're only supposed to have one, then... It, it, James Alexander Malcolm Mackenzie Fraser. I'm not even sure if that's one person or a gazillion people. So if you had to choose just one person, who would it be? Jamie Fraser from Outlander. If I have to pick just one, him, yes. <laughs> well, now I'm gonna make it even harder for you. Who is your favorite author? That is like asking me to pick my favorite book that I've written. That is, is hard and cruel and, uh, uh, <laughs> I have so many favorite authors. I like, obviously, Diana Gabaldon. If I mispronounced that last name, I apologize. I've, I've always been uh, <laughs> confused by it. I love her. I love um, Michelle Moran. I love, yes, I, I'm sure I will get laughter for this one. Um, like I mentioned, I loved the Nancy Drew books as a kid and I still do. I cannot think of the author and I think it was actually a ghost name that they used and it was multiple authors, but neither here nor there. I love those books and I still do. And yes, my face is red right now. So yes, whoever thought of that ghost name was. <laughs> well, you can rest easy because here at Cookie Jar Unleashed, it is a no judgment zone. So you are safe from that. We won't tease you. However, we will ask you a lot more questions like Canada or Australia. And I'm going to say Australia mainly because my best friend from childhood, for years we have talked about going to Australia together. Um, and I actually have a book that I want to write that's basically all of the shenanigans that we always talked about getting up to. 
So yes, Australia, especially with my best friend, would be amazing. It would be so much fun. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we would get into so much trouble, oh my gosh. That sounds like a really good time. Might I suggest bail money? All right, Puerto Rico or Italy? I'm gonna say Italy because my mother, as a teenager, toured with the National Choir. She's got an amazing singing voice. And um, one of the places that they toured through and sang was Italy. And she has a journal that I now have uh, possession of that I do plan to make a book out of, with her permission, of course. And I just think it would be so fascinating to read some of her experiences and some of the insane, and I mean insane, things that happened to her as a 15-year-old traveling abroad. Uh, you know, in, in the streets where it actually happened, I think would be really, really cool. So, Italy. Well, I really hope that works out. So that'd be really exciting for both you and your mother. All right, ski resort or beach? I'm gonna say ski resort because the book that I will be talking to you guys in a little bit about, uh, my book titled A Time to Kill, which at the time of this podcast, either will have just published or will be uh, publishing shortly. It has not released yet, June 7th. Um, takes place in a ski resort. So yes, a little bit of R&R &R and being submersed in that world again would be a lot of fun. Stonehenge or the pyramid? I have to say pyramid because ever since I was a little, little, little girl, I have been fascinated, nay, obsessed with ancient Egypt and pyramids and all that kind of stuff. Um, my, when I was really little, my dad, um, who was a stay-at-home dad, if there was something that he needed to take care of or I was a little too energetic, he would turn on the TV with either Steve Irwin, which again, Australia, yay! Uh, or uh, some sort of ancient Egypt document, plunked me down in front of the TV and I was, I was quiet. I was fascinated, I was zoned in and he could take care of um, checkbook or whatever it was he needed to do without me going absolutely berserk. Sounds like it was a win-win for you and your dad. Kudos to your dad. All right, scuba diving or skydiving? Scuba, please, please, for the love of all that is good, do not ask me to jump out of a plane that is working. I mean, to all y'all who skydive, more power to you. I do not understand you. Love you to bits and pieces. Do not, <laughs> do not understand. So yes, um, and, and the odd, even more odd part of that is, is I have uh, submechanophobia along with uh, fear of like deep open water. But yes, out of the two of those, I would st still pick scuba diving, uh, even if um, my brain is gonna be telling me the whole time that Megalodon is gonna be coming up to eat me. Uh, and yes, I know, extinct. But author imagination, strong imagination, does not listen to facts, which you know makes me able to write fantasy. Fair enough, I can appreciate a good imagination, and I'm sure your readers and the listeners can as well. So no skydiving and probably no scuba diving for you either. All right, here's an easy one. Tiger or koala bear? So I've got to go to this being like a fantasy question and because obviously neither of those would be a good pet, but my mind immediately goes fluffy. I want it. Um, <laughs> I'm a Disney nut, so I'm going to have to say tiger so I can pretend to be Princess Jasmine. Uh, yes, and its name would be Raja, and it would be amazing. You just scored so many gummy points with me, you have no idea. <laughs> that is awesome. Seriously, awesome. All right, polar bear or dolphin? I'm gonna go with dolphin because they're just so, they're, they're sea dogs, they're so cute. All right, I feel like I can guess this answer, but I might be wrong. Airplane? or cruise ship. Airplane. I just like to sneak in to say I was wrong, and here's why. I saw Titanic when I was far too little, and everybody talks about loving that movie. I was five when I first saw it and had nightmares for literal weeks about like having family members die on that. I did not, in reality, I did not. It was just the nightmares that my five-year-old imagination conjured up, and I can't with cruise ships now. My sister loves them. She has a blast. I, I, I cannot. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna bring it back to the land. Would you rather be in the city or in the country? I'm gonna say country because I love 
I love the quiet. I love the peace. I love being able to, um, like my ideal is to be in like a cabin in the woods with a fire going and I'm writing and I've got hot tea and it's snowing outside and it's just idyllic and lovely. That does sound heavenly, I can't even lie. All right, final question, Paris or Las Vegas? A part of me would love to say Vegas because my brain can also be very, very quiet um, when there's a ton going on around me because there's just so much sensory input to take in that my brain will actually shut up for a little bit. <laughs> um, or Paris, I'm gonna say Paris because I know that would be the biggest cultural change for me and I would get the most experience out of it. So I'm gonna say Paris, that would be really cool. All right, you have survived the hot seats. However, now's your chance for a book spotlight. Is there any particular book you'd like to talk about? Read a passage to us, a chapter even? As I mentioned, it is my novel, A Time to Kill. And this is a horror suspense thriller hybrid. Does this book contain adult content? Adult content? No, I am a clean author. I stay away from um, cursing and sex and stuff like that. You will find gore in my books from time to time, uh, with the exception of my fantasy horror, Occidentum Sirenus. Uh, I haven't ever had a book that's super heavy in gore and A Time to Kill is not super heavy, although there are a few deaths. Uh, trigger warnings, as I mentioned, a few deaths, some gore, there is, there are some heavy topics uh, covered in this book. So if you're looking for a light, airy, quick read, this is not for you. All right, lovelies, you have been warned. And now a sneak peek, a time to kill. Time to kill, and they thought it was just a free vacation. The blurb reads, Dear sir or madam, thrills, mystery, and adventure await at an event exclusively curated for seven brave souls. You are cordially invited to the historic Everton Mountain Resort and Ski Lodge in beautiful Sage, Colorado, to lose yourself in a story like none other. Events of the past are brought to life before your very eyes, while the secrets of the lodge unfold for you to decipher. Should your entire party choose to accept this invitation, you will spend a week in the lap of luxury and history, enjoying every amenity the lodge has to offer from a state-of-the-art spa to skiing slopes to suit both novices and, and enthusiasts alike. Will you and your party be able to learn the fates of the poor souls who vanished in Everton's beautiful snowy passes, or will their history be doomed to remain a mystery? When I received this letter, I thought I'd want a free vacation from some sweepstakes, a week away from the frantic pace of life, sounded like a dream, how wrong I was. Chapter one, 6 p.m. December 6th, Phoenix, Arizona. A scream rips from Jessica Weaver's throat and she claws at the rough fabric beneath her hands. Let me go. The world spins end over end until Jessica's head collides with something hard. The taste of a dirty penny coats her tongue and dark rumble laughter, rumbled laughter surrounds her. Please, I, Jessica's eyes spring open and the dream dies away while her heart hammers against her ribs. The cold terracotta tiles of her apartment floor against her cheek. The local news drones in the background. Swallowing, Jessica presses a palm to her chest and rakes her bangs off her forehead. You're home, you're safe. She repeats the world words until her breathing steadies. Shutting her eyes, Jessica puffs out her cheeks and pushes herself off the ground and onto the couch. Leaning, she scoops the pillows she'd knocked off on in her fall. 22-year-old Adam Calvert sweat slicks Jessica's palms and she clutches the pillow while her attention glues to the screen. His glassy-eyed smirk stares, at, stares back. Is currently awaiting sentencing after being found guilty of kidnapping and holding prisoner the then 29-year-old Jessica Weaver in the basement of his elderly parents' Gilbert home. The public remains baffled as to how her presence in the home remained a secret for over a month. Jessica's mouth goes dry when her picture flashes across the screen. Her baby blue eyes are sunken and wild, rimmed by dark circles. Her cheeks are pale and hollow while the dark brown hair, while her dark brown hair hangs in matted strings to her waist. The shirt she had won from the worn from the day he'd taken her to, to the day the image was captured hangs loose where it once hugged her curves. Burying her face in a pillow, Jessica screams until her throat aches and her voice is hoarse. 
When she rises, her vision clouds while someone bangs at her front door. Jessica's eyes widen and she leans over the end of the couch to wrap her fingers around the cold metal grip of her baseball bat. Jessica, open the door. Her lips form a thin line and her pulse settles a fraction of the sound of Mr. Gunther's voice. She drops the bat on the couch, swiping at the tears that trickle to drip from her chin. Pulling herself to her full height, she hugs her waist and shuffles to the door. What do you want? To talk to you, open the door, I'm not asking. I can hear you from here. She jolts when he pounds the metal again. Open up. She keeps the chain lock in place and cracks the door open. The burly man glares down at her with his fists clenched at his sides. This is the fifth time this week I've had to come here. Do you have any idea what it does to my daughter when you holler like a banshee? Her bed is the other side of the wall to your living room and she's been in bed puking her guts up all day. I finally got her to sleep and what happens three minutes later? She comes into my kitchen screaming about the witches in the walls. Please. I know you've been through stuff. It's messed up, but I have to protect my daughter. If you continue, I'm going to have to report you to the super. She digs her nails into her sides. I used a pillow. He blinks at her, what? I screamed into a pillow this time. She shifts her weight from one foot to the other. He rolls his eyes. These walls are paper thin, but they're the best I can afford. He pinches the bridge of his nose and shuts his eyes for a moment. Please, I'm doing the best I can, but my three-year-old has got to sleep. If she's not over this by morning, I can't take her to the sitters. Then I'm forced to skip my shift. We're making it paycheck to paycheck. I'm begging you, whatever it is you're going through, keep it to yourself. Without another word, he spins on his heel and she swallows past the lump in her throat. When she shuts her eyes, it's as, if, it's as if she can feel Adam's fingers in her hair, grasping and yanking to the point of pain, forcing her to look him in the eyes to see him when all she wanted was to be anywhere else. She slams her door and her feet pound against the tiles. When she rounds the corner, her socks slide and she braces herself on the wall. Grabbing the door frame, she pulls herself into the bathroom, flipping on the lights and catching herself on the cold porcelain of the sink. Her breath comes in ragged gasps and she watches her reflection, her gaze once again wild. Her knuckles whiten and pop when she squeezes the edge of the sink until her bones ache. Lifting her fist above her head, she smashes it into the mirror and her reflection splinters. Her hand drops to the counter and lightning shoots through her arm. She winches and shifts her palm to find a sliver of glass poking from her skin. Her lip trembles and she drags a slow, deep breath into her aching lungs as she plucks it out to drop it into the trash beside her. Pulling herself to her full height, she reaches behind her and drags her hair over her shoulder, clutching it. With her other hand, she gropes along the counter, never taking her attention off her gaze while tears gather on her lashes. When her fingertips strike the familiar steel of her scissors, she curls around them, shifting the tool in her grasp and raising it to her hair. No one can grab it if it isn't there. Her attention shifts to her throat, a crack runs across her reflection beneath her chin from one side to the other. No one can take your life if your heart stops beating. With trembling fingers, she shifts her grasp once again to open the sharp shears to their full extent, lifting them to her throat. The blade's edge presses into her skin while her pulse thrums against it, just beneath the surface. It would be easy. Adam's words echo in her mind. You can end all of this. Her eyes widen. It would end everything. The scissors clatter into the sink as she stumbles backwards until her back presses against the wall. She shuts her eyes. I can't let him win. I don't know about you guys, but OMG, like, that sounds so good. In fact, it sounds so good that I'm going to go ahead and play one more sneak peek from Justina's book. 8 p.m. December 6th, Chicago, Illinois. Jacob Bailey rakes his stiff fingers through his hair and crouches lower in the shadows behind the dumpster peering past the edge of it with his camera at the ready. Jacob breathes through his nose while a fly buzzes around his head. Cars honk and jostle for a parking spot on the street out front of La Illusion, while a few flakes drift from the sky. Come out, come out, wherever you are, Jacob says beneath his breath, and focuses his camera on the metal door a few feet away. The pounding beat of the dance music thrums on the other side of it. His thighs ache and Jacob shifts his weight and checks his watch. Come on, Jack Wagon. I don't want to be here all night just to catch your... The door swings open and the music makes his ears ring. And Jacob double checks his camera settings while the man with, while a man with broad shoulders in his, in his early 20s stumbles out with his arms slung around the waist of a leggy blonde. Got you. 
Jacob presses the button and holds it while the camera captures frame after frame of the man laughing between sloppy kisses. He winces. Lady, whatever he's got, you can do better than, a, than mob scum. Why didn't we go out the front? The woman says, stumbling through a pothole in her six inch heels. Babe, you're out with me. What more do you need? The man, man slings an arm around her shoulders and Jacob ducks deeper into the shadows, holding his breath when they near. When they pass, Jacob photographs their retreating backs until they disappear around the back of a brick building. The clouds part and his breath fogs in the moonlight. So much for hiding. He, raises his on, he rises on cramped legs to jog toward the street. He pops his collar and slips his camera in, into the inner pocket of his down coat. He keeps his head low, shifting his face away from the bouncer when he makes his way past the club's waiting line and to his car at the end of the street. He digs the keys out of his pocket and jams it into the lock. Whose car doesn't have an automatic unlock? He rolls his eyes, peering over his shoulder to find a woman in fishnets leaning against the streetlight. She winks at him and he opens the door. Someone who can't afford to talk to you. She hums, oh, I don't know. Those muscles and baby greens might be worth the exception to my, on my part. He leans on top of his car. I doubt your boss would like it. She tilts her head. The coat hides it, but I bet you're built. You can handle yourself. When she winks once more, he slips behind the wheel and shuts the door, locking it before sticking the key into the ignition. When he tis twists it, the sedan clicks. He groans, come on, beautiful, don't do this to me. He turns it again and the engine gives a sluggish groan. He rubs the steering wheel. I know it's cold, girl, but we have to get out of here. If you start, I'll get you home and under the covers for the night. Shutting his eyes, he whispers a prayer and twists the key. This time the ign ign engine st sputters and turns over, rumbling to life. See you, Jacob. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is chapter one of A Time to Kill. All right, disclaimer, lovelies. Due to time constraints, I did have to just pick out two snippets from chapter one. However, I did pick them out in order. However, when you go out and buy this gem on June 7th, you'll be able to read chapter one and all of its sister chapters in their entirety. Now available in paperback on Amazon and possibly in ebook. If not, it will be releasing shortly. Thank you again so very, very much to Cookie, AKA SE Isaac, for having me into the cookie jar, cookie jar. I am author Justina Luther. Thank you for listening. Bye. Bye, Justina. Thank you so much for being a guest on Cookie Jar Unleashed. It was a blast having you, and we hope to have you back very, very soon with your next release. After all, you do have 11 coming out. That's amazing. All right, lovelies. Well, it, sadly, today's episode must come to an end. But as always, I am so thankful to all of you. It has been a journey, an adventure, and so much fun. Until next time, hugs and kisses, Cookie.